guys, welcome back to another whiteboard chat. And today we are going to talk about SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. SHBG is a protein. It is a binding protein specifically, and we could potentially call it the availability protein. That'd be one way to think about it. So essentially it is what I like to call a regulatory protein. It is going to regulate several processes and other hormones in the body. Availability of these processes, availability of these hormones. I think right off the bat, it's important to look at this as more of a, a sign of other processes and how they're functioning rather than something that we want to manipulate in isolation. So rather than thinking about, okay, well, we want to try to lower SHBG or raise SHBG, we want to think about, okay, well, why is it high or why is it low? and then address those processes at the core. What does it bind to? Well, most people may be familiar with testosterone and free testosterone, and that how much is bound is gonna be our serum versus our free, which is unbound and usable, right? It binds to testosterone, it binds to DHT, and it binds to estrogen. Despite contrary belief, or popular belief, it actually does bind to more than testosterone, and actually, is involved in quite a few other processes, not even really so much related to uh, sex hormones. For those that are interested in these types of things, we do have a little flow chart over here of a um, feedback loop to show you, you know, how basically how things are going, right? Stimulation here, tests, conversion to estrogen, SHPG, and then free T, right? How much free T we have left bound. So what processes would be cause or be associated with low SHBG or high SHBG? Okay, low SHBG could be associated with poor sleep, metabolic syndrome. For those of you who aren't familiar, metabolic syndrome essentially just refers to a cluster of issues, uh, issues and disorders within one. So insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, high blood pressure, um, you know, all of these basically like cardiovascular type of and diabetic type of risk factors all combined. It's pretty common in, you know, normal society. You know, I've heard some crazy figures, something like over, it was well over half the people in modern society have at least uh, some level of metabolic syndrome. And frankly, it's not difficult <laughs> to get to that point. I mean, even as a bodybuilder, even as someone that eats a lot of food, there's going to be periods where you are more insulin resistant, your lipid profile might not look as good, and you have some low-grade metabolic syndrome. Now on our end, we do things like mini diets and contest prep and like all that stuff and we, you know, we reverse it and we never really get to a point that's bad, but my point is that you definitely can get there. If you never reverse it, then you're in big trouble. Hypothyroid. Hypothyroid, pretty common, right? Definitely more common than hyperthyroid, but very common to see low SHPG and hypothyroidism associated with each other, even Hashimoto's. So you will see that correlation. And there are more, we'll talk about some others, but high T1D, so type one diabetes, obviously type one diabetes is um, a failure to produce insulin from the pancreas, so a little bit different. Biliary chi chirosis, so disorder of the biliary ducts or the you know ducts and that bile flows, flows through. Hypogonadism, that is not a great uh, combination with hypogonadism when you have low, like especially if you have low testosterone and high SHPG, not a good scenario when you have you know low testosterone and low free testosterone, not great. High aromatase activity, yes, estrogen to a point would cause SHPG to go up, and why? Well, that's because it's counter regulatory, right? So yes, that's not to say estrogen is bad, but that's to say that there has to be a balance there and that eventually SHBG may go up in response. Same thing with testosterone. You may get to a point where testosterone raises to super physiological levels and SHBG could potentially rise to compensate at some, you know, at some point. And it's going to be different every, for a person. Everyone's genetically going to be different. And that's not to say that you, that your SHBG is going to rise clear up to the point of bringing your free testosterone down to low range. So if, if you're someone that is taking additional testosterone, you're still going to have high free testosterone, most likely. It's not going to overcompensate uh, 
the uh, SHBG. Low vitamin D. I put that one on there too because someone had actually asked about that at a post recently. Um, low vitamin D. And what I've found with the vitamin D is it has to be pretty chronic vitamin D deficiency. And I see a lot of low grade vitamin D deficiency, but I really don't see a direct correlation between low vitamin D and higher SHPG. I have seen it a couple times when I see like a, you know, a vitamin D 25 hydroxy serum level of like single digits. Yeah. Well, we'll probably see a correlation, but Generally, it's not that low. Generally, even newer clients of stuff are still taking like a little bit of vitamin D. Sometimes not, so we might see that. Stress, what do you know, right? <laughs> there is, uh, is potentially a relationship with cortisol and stress response and binding of sex hormones. Not good. Stress ruins everything. Over here on this, this side here, so you'll see in response to different types of hormones and ooh, PPAR, what happens to SHPG? In response to estrogen, we may see a rise. In response to T3, our active thyroid hormone, we may see a rise. In response to a PPAR, well, uh, PPARs would be, well, the most common one would probably be like the GW50, 15, 16, I believe is how you say it. Uh, even Telmosartan, it has PPAR properties to it. So you could see some response in SHPG. I'd like to check that out. I know quite a few people that use Telmosartan, so I'm going to have to pay attention to that and see how see how much of a correlation there. Because here's a, here's the thing before I you know before I go on to the last two. Uh, yes, we may see some compensation, but there's always another compensatory process that's going to also just help to balance it back out. It's kind of hard to say. Inflammation dropping it down. This will make more, that part will make more sense to you in a minute. And adiponectin. This molecule essentially helps with lipid and glucose metabolism. That's kind of a bonus. I just threw that on there. That's something you can test actually. You can test that on blood work. And it looks at lipid and glucose metabolism. Something that you could, maybe that I would add to somebody that's like high risk cardiovascular. So we're adding it to like a lipid particle size profile along with you know, our typical lipid profile. You know, we're always gonna wanna look at imaging on those types of people, have them get with a cardiologist and uh, calcium scores, echoes, so. What is your SHPG telling you? Well, that's kind of the point of all this. We know that there's obviously a large hormonal imbalance in menopausal women that are not treated with hormone replacement. So, stroke risk, not great. Also in men, there were studies, uh, at least one that I saw, and I'm you could easily make the correlation, Total testosterone associated with cardiovascular disease and um, low SHBG associated with cardiovascular disease. There you go. A lot of people have seen the studies that show possible cardiovascular risk with chronically low testosterone. So, you know, there's an association. And I should say too, I think I made a mistake on that. I should say that it's actually would be high SHBG with hypogonadism and then uh, CBD. Inflammation, potentially associated with very low SHBG. So if you're noticing a trend here, not all, but a lot of the issues actually are with very low SHBG. And that's something I really wanted to point out on this because there's kind of like this uh, obsession within the physique realm, especially those that are trying to manipulate hormones and that they want to get rid of things that are regulatory that might impede their main hormones. So what am I talking about? Well, it'd be like taking an aromatase inhibitor to get rid of estrogen, even though we know estrogen has a lot of benefits. Um, taking something to drive SHBG down, even though we know low SHBG is associated with most of the problems that we have. Another example, driving cortisol down to an unnecessarily low level, even though we need cortisol. Obviously, high cortisol is not good either, but my point is that when we look at SHBG, it's just a good tool to have to basically, it kind of confirm your, um, confirm your thoughts on other things that might be going on. So if I see an issue that I think, you know, I think there's, okay, there's probably some insulin resistance and, you know, um, we have, you know, we have hypothyroid what looks like some high, low grade hypothyroid, you have TSH is climbing or whatever, then I'm like, oh, SHBG is really low too. This just helps me confirm 
what my, you know, what my thought process is and it helps me better figure out what the issue is. So it's not, like I said, it's not something that we need to necessarily think about manipulating directly as much as it is a potential, like, assisting, like, uh, biomarker that we can look at. Now, there are, you know, potentially like a genetic issue where the person has deficiencies in some of these counter-regulatory proteins and hormones. Totally different story. Their hormones are going to be whacked off the chart normally. Um, I actually had a person that had a deficiency, and this was a consultation that I did, not a client. Pretty interesting one, nonetheless. Had a severe SHPG deficiency. They had some weird stuff, like in terms of hormones. They were on meds and things, but uh, of course, as you can imagine, it's basically taking out this regulatory hormone and all this other stuff's like flying all over the chart. So, so that's SHPG in a nutshell. What it is, what it does, why you should care about it, you know, how you can kind of use it in your lab work analysis. And you don't always have to. You know, sometimes issues are pretty obvious. You don't really, <laughs> you don't really need to look at SHBG to figure out that they have hypogonadism because their testosterone levels are subclinical. You know, so you don't always have to have SHBG. It just is helpful to, um, to point out certain issues. So hope that's helpful. Talk to you guys.